Okay, welcome to uh, EP1027 lecture 9. Um, today's lecture will be a shorter lecture because the last two lectures this week were exceeded the one hour uh, period duration of the lecture by 15 minutes each. So today's lecture will be a shorter one, maybe at best 30 or at best 40 minutes. So uh, the agenda for today's lecture is first I'll do a recap of um, last lecture, which I'll talk about Maxwell's equation and vacuum and matter, which I've written down before, but it's uh, better if you see them over and over again. And then I'll also review uh, stuff which I discussed at the end of last chapter, uh, last lecture, which is energy and momentum contained in electromagnetic fields. And in particular, I'll review uh, the definition of pointing vector and the Maxwell stress tensor. So the first four or five slides will be a review. And then I'll talk about wave equation. So it's uh, kind of a digression and this is uh, I am not sure how many of you actually done wave equation um, in your classical mechanics class or um, this is supposed to be covered in a mechanics class however I understand that some of you might not have uh, taken a class on wave equation and mechanics of waves and though for those students I will do a small maybe one or two page review of a one dimensional wave equation in particular I'll talk about the solution the, I'll, I'll just first write down the equation and then I'll um, talk about the solution uh, obtained by D'Alembert and Bernoulli. And then I'll talk about uh, the general solution which can be obtained as a superposition of many Bernoulli uh, solutions. And then I'll talk about um, EM waves in vacuum. And it'll turn out that EM waves in vacuum will obey this wave equation. This is why we will uh, study wave equation a little bit. And then we will see that indeed electromagnetic waves uh, uh, obey a wave equation and they transport those waves, transport energy and momentum. They will be given by these expressions. And we will see they will also, when these waves will be impingent on a surface, for example, a matter surface, it will cause some pressure on the surface um, due to motion of the electrons uh, induced by the EM waves or the EM fields on the, contained in the EM waves. And then EM waves in matter. I might skip this section if um, it's not really essential. It's so basically uh, a replica of this section with some minor alterations. So the reference for this lecture is uh, Griffith's um, chapter 9, uh, which is basically uh, this electromagnetic waves. So but before we do electromagnetic waves, let's recap what we learned in last lecture. So we wrote down the Maxwell equations in vacuum. Actually, this is from last to last lecture equation. In lecture 7, we already wrote these down. But in any other, it's good to review because this is a very central, um, you know, central uh, important feature of this course. So the more, uh, more times we see it, the better it is for us. So we have the four Maxwell equations. Two of them are scalar equations and two of them are vector equations. Um, these equations uh, are statements about the curl and divergence of the electromagnetic fields, electric and magnetic fields. And most of you know the first equation, which is the divergence of E equals charge density over epsilon naught. This is called Gauss law. And then Faraday uh, electromagnetic induction uh, modified the curl E equal to zero law in electrostatics into something which is known as the Faraday Lenz's law, which is curl of E plus del V del D equals zero. And then from magnetic statics, we inferred that magnetic fields had no sources or sinks. As a result, magnetic field lines were closed loops. And this is uh, encapsulated in the statement that divergence of B vanishes. And then finally, Maxwell wrote down a correct version of Ampere's law, which was from magnetic statics, which was initially curl of B equals mu naught J, but then Maxwell fixed it by adding this extra term in the equation, which made it consistent with conservation of charge. Um, which is known as the displacement current. So this is now the Ampere Maxwell law. And then I also remarked, and drew you, in fact, I drew your attention to the fact that the first and the fourth equation are truly equations of motion because they relate cause and effect, the so or source and uh, the field. So rho and j produce E and B fields, and they are related by these equations. On the other hand, uh, the second and third equations are not really equations of motion, but they are constraints on the solutions of the theory. You can solve these equations, but if those equations don't, um, those solutions do not satisfy these constraints, they are not valid solutions. So these are, you can think of it, uh, these two, the Faraday lenses law and no sources or sinks law, these are constraints on the theory, are constraints on the solutions of the theory. And these are also known as Bianchi identities. 
And then we also wrote down in the last class, which was a new thing, uh, Maxwell equations and media. As you can see, the first equation has changed because in media we have bound charges. If we move them on the left hand side, we have to change E to something else, which is known as the displacement field D. So Gauss law gets modified. Uh, Faraday lenses law remains as it is, unmodified, although I've written in a different way. I've transferred it on the left and right hand side. And then no sources of sinks law that is remaining also the same, no, no change. Even in media, this is true. However, the Ampere-Maxwell law has to be changed because, um, as you know, uh, magnetic polarization means there will be induced uh, bound, bound currents. And those bound currents um, uh, are actually proportional to the H fee, B field. So these have to be brought over here. And then we have to change the definition of B to something else, which is what H is. Okay. And then instead of E, you have del D del T. So uh, this is the new Ampere Maxwell law for uh, material media, uh, by which I mean it, it is a dielectric and a paramagnetic. Okay, so um, it is clear that uh, why this term is now called the displacement current because it is rate of change proportional to rate of change of the uh, displacement field and it is dimensions of current. So this equation I also remarked that has too many unknowns D, B, E and H. So there are like 12 unknowns and we have only 6 equations. So this is not going to be a closed system. We cannot solve this. So uh, we need something which is known as the constitutive relation. It's a bit like equation of state in thermodynamics where you have to you relate some variables so that these equations become a, um, you know optimally optimal number equal number of variables and equal number of equations and this is one of the first relation is d uh, as a function of e in particular we'll take a linear function um, which is a linear isotropic homogeneous dielectric isotropic means it's same in all directions and homogeneous means it's same at all locations so it's not a function of x uh, or not, nor is it a function of the angle. Similarly, for uh, paramagnetics, uh, you should consider, we consider something which is known as linear isotropic homogeneous paramagnetics, in which H field is related to the B field. In fact, it is parallel to the B field and it's equal to 1 over mu. So this mu is known as the absolute permittivity of the paramagnetic, and this epsilon is known as the permittivity, absolute permittivity of the dielectric. Um, so, um, these equations are necessary. If not, you need some. This is the special case of linear homogeneous isotropic uh, media. However, in general, in order to solve, we just have to give specified d as a function of e and h as a function of b. Once you do that, these equations uh, become solvable. Uh, however, these are first sort of differential equations, so we need some boundary conditions to solve them. So these boundary conditions are written here. Um, from Gauss law, you can consider uh, this uh, a pillbox type of Gaussian surface straddling two media, and um, from that we, um, from this equation, we can use um, this Gaussian pillbox to derive this relation, which says that the normal component of the displacement field suffers a discontinuity by an amount exactly equal to the surface free charge density on the boundary of the two media, and the and the uh, tangential component of the electric field is of course continuous which is a consequence of this law and uh, this doesn't make any contribution this contribution in fact vanishes uh, when the moment we take the rectangular loop uh, so this is obtained by taking a rectangular loop and applying stokes theorem to the rectangular loop this rectangular loop again it straddles the boundary from both sides and we take the limit when the loop approaches the boundary from both sides in that limit this contribution vanishes and you have from the left hand side um, uh, that the tangential component of E is continuous. Then for magnetic fields, we apply Gauss theorem again to a Gaussian pillbox, straddling the boundary from both sides. And this gives you, that since the right hand side is zero, this tells you the normal component of B across the boundary is continuous. Um, this statement, curl of H equals J free, this statement, again, we use Stokes theorem to a rectangular loop across the boundary. And we take the limit when the, it's the a transverse side of the loop go to zero as the loop approaches the boundary from both sides. In this case, it leads to a discontinuity in the tangential component of um, the edge field in terms of the surface uh, current, current which is flowing through the boundary surface. So this is given by this equation. I would implore you guys to actually try to do this 
integrate this, uh, sorry, um, consider Stokes' theorem and derive this condition from this. In particular, I want to see, um, you know, you want to check whether you can uh, get this form on the right hand side or not, this cross product, which is not something straightforward. So it'll take a minute or two for you to figure out. So I will ask you to please do this on your own. Of course, you are unable to do this always Griffiths where he has done meticulously how to derive this. Okay, so this was the recap which I wanted to do. And then, um, um, okay, recap about Maxwell equation. But then we also need to do a recap about the energy contained in the EM fields. So we started by looking at work done on uh, distribution of charges, um, which is subjected to the electromagnetic forces from e uh, due to each other's uh, electric and magnetic fields. And we wrote down that the energy conservation law in the form of a continuity equation, um, which showed that a continuity equation, as you know, most of you know, gives you the conserved quantity density and the conserved quantity charge current density. So in this case, we saw that the, the total amount of energy conserved is not just the energy of the charges, but the total energy is actually the energy contains kinetic energy of the charges which are moving around, plus the electromagnetic field which contains energy as well. Okay, so this total energy is conserved, not individually the energy of the charges. And that is given by this equation. This quantity S, I'm sorry, um, so, um, let me let's this is the continuity equation this is the energy density and as you can see this is the energy current density so let's uh, delve a bit deeper on what these quantities are so energy density as i said is the sum of the energy density of the kinetic energy density of the charges and the em fields the em field expression energy density looks in this form so there's one term which is proportional to the square of the electric field and the other term is square of the magnetic field so this is what e and b fields store per unit volume and this energy um, current density, which is energy flux per unit time per unit cross-sectional area, is given by this pointing vector S, which is this, okay? So um, this is telling you if you have, let's say, a, a surface which is, uh, has a unit vector along the z-axis, then how much um, energy is flowing out along that direction, in the z-direction, okay? Uh, I'm sorry, uh, yeah, that's right. So uh, that will be the z component of this vector, okay? The z component of this vector, e cross b. So if you repeat this argument for a material media, instead of b, what you find is that the pointing vector is given by e cross h, okay? It doesn't have to be linear media. Of course, in linear media, it is very easy, but in general, it is e cross h. Um, in order to get linear momentum conservation, we have to look at the force. So we have a distribution of charges and they are placed in a region containing electromagnetic fields. And this electromagnetic field could be produced by them, the charges themselves in which, so the charges are um, exerting forces on each other and through the E and B fields they produce. And that is given by this equation, the Lorentz force law. And little f is the Lorentz force density. So the Lorentz force density can be written in this form. Uh, if you simplify this equation, we simplified a lot using Maxwell equations and vector calculus identities. And we wrote down this equation in this form. So this is a vector. And this is also a rate of change of a vector, so it's a vector. This is actually a divergence of a tensor, so which is defined this way. So as you can see, there are two um, two indices which are contracted, i, and therefore there's one free index, j. Any object which has a single free index is a vector. So this is also a vector, okay? So the force can be written in this way, and if you, this quantity, it is written as divergence of a two tensor, rank two tensor, plus uh, minus this quantity. So this uh, two rank tensor is something known as the Maxwell stress tensor, and it is defined by this formula. Um, so the net force, if I plug this guy in, if I compute the net force on a charge distribution, charge current distribution, um, integral volume integral of the divergence by Gauss theorem will give you some surface integral. And this, of course, this will remain a volume integral itself, rate of change. Now, um, if it's a static distribution, this term will go to zero because DDT of a static distribution is zero. But this term survives. So 
even when the distribution of so if you consider uh, charged sphere which is sitting right there a sphere on which we have a uniform uniformly charged sphere this term will be zero but this term will be there so um, this this then is expressing the force um, experienced by elements of the charge sphere due to other rest of the charge sphere other other parts of the charge sphere okay so that they exert force on that element and hence that element feels a pressure and stress so the stress tensor as i said in the last lecture the diagonal components give you the normal force per unit area which is the pressure and then the uh, off diagonal components like one two two three and all they give you the force experience in the i direction um, per unit uh, area in the which is normal in in the one three plane so these are tangential forces which are shear okay tangential stresses which are shear now now that we have expression for the force we can write down the energy momentum conservation by using newton's second law and we found out that momentum conservation takes the form of as expected a continuity equation so del del t of momentum density plus divergence of j instead of j we have minus t so this is the momentum current density so this is the continuity equation which reflects uh, the linear momentum conservation for a distribution of charges and currents and of course electromagnetic fields produced by them so the total amount of momentum is total momentum is uh, momentum contained in the charges as well as the momentum contained in the field uh, for your convenience, I've written this equation in component notation as well. This was vector notation without any indices, uh, index-free. But here we have written in the index notation to denote components. So ith component of this equation is, this will be pi. And then um, this will be minus tij. So there you can see j is summed over. j is summed. So that's why i is the free index. So this Tij represents the momentum current density of the ith component. So, so T i minus Tij is the ith momentum flow per unit area. Uh, I'm sorry, this should be J. Please pardon me. So, um, so it's the ith momentum flow per unit area, and that area has a normal in the j direction per unit time. Okay. So this is the interpretation of minus Tij. It is giving you the flow of the ith component of momentum uh, in an area which is normal to the j direction there's a typo here it should be j direction okay so from this we can uh, figure out from this expression for the momentum we see that the momentum stored in the em field is given by again the pointing vector divided by c square which is just epsilon times e cross b you can repeat the same argument for the material media in that case the uh, uh, and momentum stored per unit volume of the in the EM fields is given by D cross B. Okay. So and, uh, we can also show that we, uh, EM fields also have some angular momentum per unit volume. So yeah, per unit volume in the EM field is given by the simple formula L is equal to X times P, X times momentum density, in this case, momentum density of the fields. So um, we learn that electromagnetic fields have everything you have energy linear momentum as well as angular momentum so they are a physical entity and that is why um, the interaction between two point charges or two current elements uh, should not be thought of as a two body problem but it's a many body problem in which first uh, the charges interact with the field and then the field exerts um, you know field is in contact with two of them so it's a, like a three body uh, problem that the charges and the field which is the intermediary Okay, so I think this is where we will end the recap of our last lecture. So this is good because this um, recap is good because it will put you in good stead for the quiz which is upcoming on Monday. So today's lecture recap should be a good um, uh, highlight or you know highlights package for the quiz, which is to take place on Monday. And now we will begin um, a new stuff for today's lecture. First, I want to do a sort of digression on wave mechanics because some of you might not have studied wave mechanics in the classical mechanics class so the wave mechanics um, uh, the f beginning point of all these uh, study is the wave equation in one dimension so one by one dimension i mean one space dimension so we have a wave uh, uh, wave field parameter this function f of x and t sometimes it is known as the wave field parameter 
So this wave uh, wave field parameter obeys this kind of an equation. As you can see, it's a hyperbolic equation, but it's a linear equation, which is good. So it's second derivative in space, second derivative in time, and we have to put um, quantity with velocity, dimensions of velocity, in order to make them these two terms dimensionally identical. This velocity will turn out to be the velocity of the phase of this wave. So the wave is a one dimensional of wave moving in x axis along the x axis um, is given by this equation and the velocity of the phase is uh, the same velocity which appears in the equation. Um, of course this equation is as I said it's a second order hyperbolic differential equation and the solution was first obtained by D'Alembert. Um, the solution I have written down for your convenience. It is very easy, you just do a change of variables and you can arrive at this equation in like two, three lines of, um, you know, algebra. So what D'Alembert showed is that the generic solution of this equation, F wave field parameter, is given by something which is moving in the right, g of x minus vt. This is a right moving wave. As you can see, constant phase surfaces will move on the right. And plus something which is moving on the left. So g and h are arbitrary functions. So any arbitrary function g and h will solve, satisfy this equation. You can check, you can directly check by plugin. That won't be a proof, of course, that would be a verification, but a verification is also sort of a proof. But D'Alembert obtained this in very simple, two simple states by steps by changing variables to, you know, x plus using these variables that some of you can already guess because the solution is expressed in these variables. Maybe this equation simplify when you write in these new variables instead of x and t. And when you do that, the equation uh, becomes very easily solvable. And as I said, the general solution is a solution of a left moving wave, right moving wave plus a so, um, uh, right moving wave. So this kind of a solution, each of them satisfies, g will satisfy and h will individually satisfy this equation. So this kind of a solution is sometimes known as a linear superposition. And the reason is because this is a linear differential equation. Some of you have taken uh, maybe a differential equation class for partial differential equations. And the um, linear equations have the property that if you have a bunch of, if you have solutions fi, where i goes from one to some number n, then you can add arbitrary, add them with arbitrary constant coefficients. And that new function will also be a solution. So this is what I've written. So by the way, this quantity is sometimes denoted by a box so that's why I, I haven't bothered writing this full quantity and I've just written a box. So box of f equals, but f is uh, this linear sum. So um, box acting on this linear sum. And then box will spare the coefficients because these are constant coefficients. The box will hit the fi's, the function fi's. But then these are solution, individual solutions to the wave equation. They're zero. So arbitrary, uh, this is also zero. So if you find a bunch of solutions to the wave equation fi, you can sum them for arbit with arbitrary constant coefficients, and that will also be a solution. So this is reflected here because it's a solution, a left moving solution, right moving solution, and a left moving solution, left moving wave. So um, um, it is important to also discuss another form of the solution, which was obtained not by D'Alembert but by Bernoulli, which is a special kind of wave in which the wave looks like a sine wave or sinusoidal wave. So um, um, the solution, actually, this has got to, too far below. Uh, so as you can see, it's a sum of a right moving cosine wave and a left moving cosine wave. So these numbers delta 1 and delta 2 are called uh, phases or initial phases. And this omega, so as you can see, instead of x minus vd, I have taken, I have multiplied by k. So kx and kv, this quantity kv I'm calling omega, okay? So this is another form of the solution. These represents sinusoidal waves. g and h could be the arbitrary function. It doesn't have to be sinusoidal functions. And D'Alembert showed that, okay, any arbitrary wave profile is good. It doesn't have to be sinusoidal. But then Bernoulli solution is in particular is when you have a sinusoidal solution. And a and b are, of course, sometimes known as the amplitude of the wave. Most of you know. K is called the wave number, which is twice pi over the wavelength. And omega is known as the angular frequency. So um, as most of you have done in your high school, when we have such sinusoidal 
solutions, it is more convenient to go over to complex notation. So uh, we have written the general wave solution, uh, sorry, the sinusoidal wave solution f of xt with a curly, with a tilde over top, which means a complexified version. And so this is given by this instead of cosine. Instead of the cosine, we have taken um, exponential. And of course, there should be, you can ask, what about the phase? Shouldn't there be a phase? Because we had delta 1. And the answer is no, the phase is already included in the amplitude. So anything which is not dependent on space and time, we lump in inside the amplitude, OK? So we had um, A here. So F, uh, you, if you complexify, so this will become cos uh, plus I sine. So that will be exponential of this. Or another way to think of it is that the real part of this is this. So the real part of the complex form is this real Bernoulli solution. So, um, and the phase is included in the amplitude. The complex form is good because the amplitude information is contained in the phase, okay? Only the space-time part is separated out in exponential. The rest of it and the I delta part of it is absorbed in the amplitude. And then an arbitrary, so D'Alembert's solution, which was a general solution. Um, so D'Alembert's solution is a general solution, doesn't have sinusoidal. But then we are, we are from all familiar with the notion of a Fourier transform. I, I hope some of you are. In which any arbitrary function can be expanded in this plane way, uh, in the sinusoidal basis, by which I mean exponentials. E to the i, using the Euler formula, you can split it up into cosine and sine. So, and then... For arbitrary, the solution is for a given fixed k, but of course we can show that this will be a solution for arbitrary k. This solution, the solution satisfies the wave equation for arbitrary k, um, not arbitrary omega. Omega is determined by the k. Once we fix k, omega gets automatically fixed by this equation with v is the parameter appearing in the wave equation. So that's why we didn't sum over omega. Uh, moment we sum over k. Because omega is k times v, this is automatically summing over different omega. Okay, And then this k can be anything, so we sum over all k. In particular, if it's a continuous, uh, we instead of summing, we have to take an integral. So sometimes this is known as the Fourier component, this amplitude, complexified amplitude. Um, when we solve this wave equation, this is the second order partial differential equation, so we will need two boundary conditions and two initial conditions, because these are conditions where time has to be integrated. So we will need two initial conditions, initial at time t equal to zero, the configuration and the velocity, I guess. And then we will need the boundary condition, two boundary condition at x equal to whatever the boundaries are. In particular, um, what you have learned in high school already is that whenever you the wave cross some kind of a boundary to another medium, the frequency of the wave must remain the same. However, the wave speed and the wavelength will change. Okay, So the frequency of the incident, uh, the reflected and transmitted waves, they remain the same. And the frequency and, and, and the speed and the wavelength will change. Okay, So these are the boundary conditions which will again, we will... So we are doing this digression because we will show that EM waves in vacuum, EM fields in vacuum obey a wave equation. And so we are preparing the ground for that. Okay. Okay, so this was about a two-slide summary of wave equation basics. We learned about the wave equation, the D'Alembert solution, and then Bernoulli solution in terms of sine waves, and the fact that the generic solution can be written as a superposition of sine waves, which is given in complex notation by this formula, very important formula. In particular, the important, con important thing to notice is that the amplitude is not just the real amplitude, but it includes the phase, it includes the phase information, this will become important because the phase information will become important when we um, superpose different waves and that will describe the interference. So let's look at Maxwell equations in vacuum. So in the absence of sources, um, the Gauss law will become divergence E equal to zero because rho is zero. And the ampere Maxwell law will become curl B equals uh, mu zero J is zero. So curl B equals to this equation. So uh, the right hand side is zero now. Uh, 
So the, these equations, if you process a bit, you will see that the electric field and magnetic field obey a wave equation. So let's see how that happens. Uh, so we will take curl of both sides of this equation. So we have curl of curl of E and then curl of this quantity. So that is minus of del del T curl of B. And curl of curl of E, we can use some vector identities, uh, vector calculus identities to simplify this. So the, uh, using some identities, this becomes um, gradient of uh, uh, divergence of E minus Laplacian of E, this quantity using the famous vector identity. But then uh, divergence of E is zero because there are no charges, so this term drops out. And the right left hand side, we just have minus of Laplacian of uh, the electric field vector. And then on the right hand side, we have del T of curl of B, but curl of B using the mod uh, new Ampere Maxwell law, we can put this to be del 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 E del T one over C square. So the right hand side becomes minus this C square. So if we bring everything to one side, what we have, or, or this guy to other side, we have this equation for the E field, okay? And lo and behold, this is the wave equation, which we learned about just two seconds before. This is the wave equation. This was in one dimension. So when you go to three dimension, this guy, del del x squared, will turn into the Laplacian. Um, so indeed, we have the Laplacian minus this term. And you, again, taking curl of this equation, you can arrive at the similar equation or wave equation for B. So E and B, in the absence of sources, obey it through the 3D wave equation. This is the important part. Okay. And one particular thing to observe is that the wave velocity or the phase velocity is the speed of light, C squared. Remember how C squared entered the Maxwell equations? We never had light anywhere featuring. So C entered the moment we wrote down the Biosavert law or in particular we wrote down the magnetic field created by point charges which are moving with some velocity v. So uh, uh, how did we get that? Uh, we moved from a static frame or the rest frame of the charge to the lab frame in which the charge was moving with velocity v and the equations relating those to uh, those the rest frame and the lab frame in which the charge is moving had some factors of the speed of light. So this that speed of light is inherited in all that equations not for any other reason. So it seems like the electromagnetic waves have a speed of light sitting inside them, from which Maxwell identified that indeed uh, light is nothing but an EM wave phenomenon, okay? Because the speed of light appears in the Maxwell equ in the uh, wave equations for the electromagnetic field, he concluded that uh, light must be nothing but electromagnetic field itself. Electromagnetic wave, I'm sorry, uh, which is a wave in which uh, um, the, very, the wave field parameter is an e, M, e and B field. So this is a general wave field parameter for, electro, for magnetic, electromagnetic fields in vacuum. This wave field parameter is nothing but the E and B field. Um, so next thing we will look at is a very specific kind of wave. So we know waves come in all shapes and sizes. They can have circular or spherical wave fronts. You can have cylindrical wave fronts for axial sources, for line sources. Uh, you have spherical wave fronts for point sources, which are emitting the wave. But let's look at um, the simplest form, which is plane waves, okay? So what are plane waves? Plane waves are wave fronts, which are planes. We, most of you know what a wave front is. Wave front is a surface on which um, the variables have the same phase, exact same phase. Um, so it's a front of uh, it's a surface of constant phase surface now that constant phase surface of the wave front in plane waves is a plane um, and it is normal to that plane is the direction of propagation or the k which will be given by the k so k is the direction in which the wave is propagating and the normal to that the surface which is normal to that k is a plane and which is the plane of constant phase or the wave front so this k, uh, you can check that instead of getting i k x, this was in one dimension, we have k dot x when we go to three dimensions. And you can check yourself when you plug this, this will give you, this will indeed solve the 3D equation. If you plug this in this equations, these solutions, you'll see they automatically satisfy. So this quantity k dot x is, uh, k is known, k vector is known as a wave vector. And omega is, of course, the frequency which is given in this case by um, 
magnitude of k times c. I don't know why I don't have that in my book, in my uh, notes, but let me just back up a little bit. Here we saw that the wave frequency is given by k times v. When you go to three dimensions, instead of um, you will have the magnitude of the k wave vector times the velocity in this case. In this case, the this is k magnitude of k times the speed of light. Okay. So um, now, uh, instead of, uh, we know these solve the wave equation, but it's interesting to look, plug these equations, uh, plug the solution in the, max, in the Maxwell equation themselves, okay? So let's plug this solution in, for example, the Gauss law. If you do that, uh, the moment you take a divergence of this quantity, the divergence will skip the amplitude and hit this uh, phase part because this is the function of x. And what you will get, the divergence of E this divergence will get the when you have an exponential you take a derivative you get the exponent so k will come here k dot e or in this case for the no sources of sinks law k dot b equal to zero so um, e and b fields are transverse wave because the wave parameter wave field parameter it is fluctuating in a direction which it is aligned in a direction which is normal to the propagation of the wave so these are orthogonal to the propagation. E and B are in on confined on the on a plane which are orthogonal to K, right? So E and B are both orthogonal to K, so that means E and B uh, they lie on a surface which is orthogonal to K. Of course, E and B can be parallel in which uh, they are not on a plane but on a line themselves. But we will just a moment we will see that the, it doesn't happen. E and B are not parallel. In fact, if you use Faraday's law and you plug the wave solution in Faraday's law. What you will find uh, is that curl will become, as you can, as I said, you can replace this divergence because we're taking a divergence. This is the derivative. Derivative will pull down a factor of k from the exponent. So we'll have k cross e, and d dt will give you a factor of omega uh, exponential. When you take a time derivative, it will give you a factor of minus i omega, which you have here. So if you combine that, if you uh, rearrange that equation a bit, which it will give you this equation. So k cross e, and then if you divide by omega, you'll get a factor of c as well, because omega is k of c. So uh, remember, we have this unit vector k. So it is k divided by the magnitude of k. Uh, so this equation tells you that uh, k, e, and b, or e, b, and k form an orthogonal triad. They have to appear in a cyclic, cyclic, um, you know, order. E, B, and K are K, E, B. K, E, B, they form an orthogonal triad. So that is good. That is enough to say that uh, the wave front uh, is orthogonal to K vector, and then E and B lie on that surface, which is orthogonal to K. So these are uh, transverse waves. Now let's consider the energy and momentum. Because B is this, uh, we can find out the energy contained in the B field, which is 1 over twice the uh, square magnitude or square of the magnitude of the B. And it will turn out to be exactly equal to this quantity. But this quantity is also the electric field density. So uh, in EM waves, the magnetic field and the electric field contain equal amount of energy. The amount of energy which is distributed in the magnetic field individually and the electric field individually, they are equal. So the total energy in the E and B field is twice of uh, this quantity. So this half will go away. So the energy density contained in the EM wave propagating in a region is given by this. And of course, energy flux density, which is the normal flow of energy per unit area, normal to that. Uh, okay, I've already said normal uh, too many times. Uh, per unit time is given by the is also sometimes called the intensity, is given by the pointing vector, right? Pointing vector is E cross B by mu naught, but B is this quantity. When you do the triple product, you get a simple answer. So E cross B, uh, which is this, will give you this quantity, this answer, and it is in the direction of K. So energy is transported in the direction of the wave. So this is good. Um, that means the phase and the energy are being transported uh, along the same direction. This doesn't always happen. In, in fact, in material media, phase can travel in one direction and the energy can travel in another direction. Um, so this is not a generic situation. But here it turns out 
that the energy is transported in the same direction as the phase uh, because they are exactly proportional parallel to each other and the magnitude of the energy flux density is given by this this mass of energy is being transported in this direction k uh, per unit area normal to this k okay uh, the momentum density we also obtained, we already know, it's given by this pi em, pi subscript em, which is 1 over c square of the pointing vector. This is the momentum contained per unit volume. Uh, if you take a, a, unit, uh, a unit volume inside an electromagnetic field, this is the amount of momentum which is contained. So, of course, momentum contains three components. So, individual component will give you the uh, that component per unit volume. So this is also proportional to K. So momentum is also transported along K, not just energy, but momentum is also transported along K. And again, as I said, in material media, this does not happen. As most of you know, momentum is given by D cross B and E S is given by E cross H. And if the media is not linear, homogeneous or isotropic, then these two won't coincide and then energy and momentum will move in different directions. Transport, energy transport is not always the same as direction of momentum transport. Nonetheless, in case of vacuum, this happens nicely, and in fact, it will also happen for linear isotropic homogeneous media. But many, many uh, substances in nature, for example, many crystals are not that. For that, most of you know, there is a um, phenomenon which is known as birefringence, which you've learned in high school. In which you have two different rays, E ray and the O ray, and that all that phenomena happens because um, the uh, direction in which energy moving and phase moving is not the same, are not the same. Um, so yeah, the last one comment I wanted to make is that the momentum density magnitude is equal to the energy density divided by C, which is the speed of light. And then when this uh, electromagnetic wave um, falls on some kind of a surface it leads to exerts the force on the surface uh, per unit area that is called the pressure so this let's say you have some surface which absorbs the em waves um, so when em wave is absorbed these energy and momentum is absorbed by the wall or that surface so the momentum from the em wave get transferred to the absorber and as a result the absorber experiences a force or a pressure so that pressure is the normal force per unit area. And this normal force is of course given by this quantity. Sorry, momentum transferred. Force is momentum transfer per unit time divided by cross-sectional area. Uh, time, uh, so this will turn out to be equal to the energy momentum density times C. And the reason is that if you consider per unit time, the amount of the amount of uh, energy, momentum transferred is the amount of is the momentum contained in a volume, which has dimension c d t in one. In, so the in time d t, the amount of momentum which is absorbed by the wall is equal to the momentum of uh, the light wave or the E M wave contained in the volume c d t. And unit cross-sectional area and length c d t. So. Uh, if you take a unit time, so C times 1, and then the momentum density is pi em. So momentum density times the volume, C times unit cross-sectional area, gives you the momentum which is absorbed by the wall or transferred from the wave to the wall. So this is the quantity, pi em times C. And then, of course, because this is a sinusoidal wave, it is fluctuating, pi em um, is fluctuating. Actually, I made some mistakes. I think I will rectify this. So this shouldn't be uh, the magnitude E. This should be the vector square. Uh, these should all be vectors because these are a function of space and time. So they fluctuate with space and time. If you go, if I go back, so these are functions of space and time. So maybe it's better to indicate that. So this is a function of space and time. Um, so we can talk about the average pressure per cycle um, and per cycle this will be average of that and if this is a sinusoidal fluctuation so square of the sinusoidal 
average per unit cycle will be half of that, half of the magnitude. Uh, so this is the half of the magnitude, okay? I'm sorry, so this is given by this and this squared, when you take the average over a cycle, this will give you half the square of the magnitude. So half the square of the magnitude, okay? So this is the pressure obtained, uh, experienced by an absorber, which is absorbing the EM waves incident on it. Uh, for a reflector, not an absorber, but a reflector which reflects the wave back, uh, the momentum transfer will be twice as much because not only the wave is uh, losing, giving its momentum completely to the wall, but instead it is getting reflected back. So its momentum direction is uh, reversed. As such, the uh, change in the momentum is twice of the change in case of absorption. And this half goes away in that case, so you have this formula. So at a microscopic level, it is easy to understand why do you have this. The idea is let's consider uh, this wall or absorber on which this electromagnetic wave with direction K is incident on. And then E and B, as I said, are orthogonal to the direction K. E, B and K form an orthogonal triad. Um, I'm sorry. This should be B and this should be, I made a mistake here. Um, this should be E and this should be B, uh, sorry. E cross B is a K in this direction. So uh, this is actually a mistake. Instead, this should be B and this should be E. So nevertheless, this is uh, still going to work for our explanation. Uh, so what happens is that when this is incident on the surface, the surface contains charges, let's say electrons or something. And this E is going to yank it in this direction. And then, uh, uh, so the charges will start to move in the direction of the E, but then once they acquire velocity, the magnetic field is going to um, exert a force on them by an amount V cross B. So V cross B will act, and then V cross B, if this is in the velocity, V cross B will turn out orthogonal direction. So, so in fact, it will turn out to be in the same direction as, because E cross B is K, and E, the velocity of the charge will initially will be in the direction of E. So V cross B also will be in the direction of K. So they'll, the wall will experience the force in the same direction as K. This is the pressure I'm talking about. This microscopic forces uh, on the surface of the absorber or a reflector is what's causing the force. Okay, microscopically it's easy to understand. Okay, EM waves in matter. I didn't want to cover this slide uh, because it's a bit of a repetition. But uh, whatever I said for vacuum equally applies when we go to media in particular. Uh, I'm considering linear isotropic homogeneous media. So these are the constitutive relations. And then instead of H, I will just write in terms of B. And instead of D, I will just write E because D and E are proportional, parallel and proportional. And then uh, again, you take curl of this equation, these two equations, you land up with uh, two wave equation. End up with wave equations, but the only difference is that the wave velocity will not be equal to c anymore because of these constants which appear. Instead, the wave uh, will be given by this velocity is given by one over square root of mu times e, um, which can be written as in another form which historically written in another form this constant 1 over mu not mu times e which is the permittivity of permittivity of the medium and the permeability of the medium so this is written as a velocity of light divided by n because it turns out this velocity most of the time is less than the speed of light so speed of light divided by some number greater than 1 um, this number is known as the refractive index so this is the a velocity of EM waves in a medium, but EM waves are light waves, so this is the velocity of light waves in that medium. So this uh, number n is called the refractive index. So, so this is one slide about, uh, you know, uh, you can again write down the energy contained and you can show the same things that the pointing vector in this case will be, instead of mu naught, it will be mu for linear homogeneous isotropic media. But the fact remains that the E and B field are um, orthogonal to each other. The crucial distinction means the magnitude of B field instead of being E over C, it's now E over V. And then these are the boundary conditions of the interface of media. This we will need when we talk about reflection and refraction. So let's stop here.
and we'll next class we will discuss um, more detailed uh, various wave propagation in media light wave propagation in media okay thank you